we're going to talk about actually this, neuromorphic nanoelectronic materials, which is a hell of a mouthful. So you got in touch, Sean, I don't know, about a month ago or so. I've lost all track of time under these circumstances. You said it's a while since we did something on the links between nano and computing. I said it has, it is indeed. And then actually, just before that, I'd been reading this month's, or at the time, that month's issue of Nature Nanotechnology, which is one of the key nanotechnology journals. And this is a review paper in that. There's a massive push to integrate nanoelectronics with computing, of course, to push down the limits of computing, but to actually integrate different ways of processing information that go far beyond what's known as the von Neumann architecture. I think you've done the von Neumann architecture before on Computer File. I think Dave did a video on it, so I'm sure Sean will put the link in somewhere. The key bottleneck when it comes to von Neumann is that we've got a central processing unit and we've got memory. The bottleneck is that we've got a transfer between those two units. That's not what our brain does. Our brain doesn't have a CPU over here and memory over here and transfer between the two. And that transfer is not only limits bandwidth, it also limits the ability to train these systems. And although there's a vast amount of work in machine learning, countless computer, video, computer file videos on machine learning, I think we've even done one in the past, Sean, um, on, on machine learning. But it seems a little bit strange in that what we're doing is we're taking the machine learning idea, artificial neural nets, and we're imposing it on the von Neumann architecture, which is very different from how our brains, are work, how our brains work. So then the question is, well, can we change the substrate? Can we change the architecture so we get something which is a bit more brain-like? The other key issue with von Neumann is it's incredibly energy hungry. In this paper, there's a study that's quoted that says by 2040, we're gonna need 10 to the 27, 10 to the power of 27 joules to continue on doing CMOS logic as we currently do. That's a real problem because that's more than the energy budget of the entire world at the moment. But um, surely the energy efficiency is driving down as well in CMOS, right? The energy f efficiency is getting, you know... Sorry, sorry, I meant to say, yes. Yeah, it's getting better. Yeah. 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 So the energy, it's, it, yes, so we're making improvements, but we've still got this key bottleneck and key latency. That's the other thing. There will always be an inherent latency with the von Neumann architecture because you've got to transfer information between these two. So the key thing is, why can't we co-locate? Why can't we have the memory and the processing in the same place? Because that's what our brain does. And moreover, this is incredibly energy efficient and no more than, I don't know, a banana and a cup of coffee. And Sean got me a cup of coffee this morning, so I'm fairly fired up at the moment. Um, and no more than that. I can solve problems in terms of face recognition and in terms of um, identification of different people or different objects that it takes countless CPU hours to train a machine learning algorithm to do. So in many ways, we can beat a computer. And the key issue, the key reason for that is because we've got this different architecture in our heads. What, one comment that always comes up is, why didn't he discuss this? Why didn't he discuss this? Why didn't he discuss this? That, 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 that. It's a five or 10 minute video. We can't discuss everything. And I just want to try and get how large this field is. A survey of neuromorphic computing and neural networks and hardware. 2,682 references. The reference list is much, much longer than the paper itself. So this is a huge field. I can only scratch the surface. Hopefully, if Computer Vile viewers are interested in this, we can do maybe more videos on this because it, is, it really is a fascinating area. Anyway, where will we start? So one thing that comes up time and time again is this word Memristor. Memristor synapses for neuromorphic computing. Nanoscale Memristor device a synapse in neuromorphic systems. Review of Memristor devices in neuromorphic computing. Memristors with diffuse dynamics as synaptic emulators for neuromorphic computing, etc., etc. It comes up time and time again. So we've got two words there, synapse and Memristor. How does the sort of processing unit in here work? How does the brain work? How does any brain work? How does any biological brain work? Well, you have neurons and you have synapses. And synapses are the gaps between neurons. And those neurons communicate with each other via, well, how do they do that? They do that via what are called neurotransmitters. And you, you program these, you set the state is probably the best way if we're gonna talk about computing language. You set the state of those neurons by controlling the ion flow. 
So in a cell, you've got ions inside, you've got ions outside. What's an ion? An ion is a charged atom. So you've got potassium, you've got chloride, you've got calcium, you've got a range of different ions. And a neuron is really, and certainly a synapse, is really an electrical device. So what it's doing, it's, it's, we're controlling electrical current due to those ions. The charged particles, we're controlling how they flow, therefore we have an electrical device. That's how a computer works. What do we do in a computer? We control where the electrons go, we control where the charge goes. So the question is, why can't we take this architecture and put it into the solid state? And that's exactly what neuromorphic computing is all about. The question is now, can we develop an artificial synapse? And to develop an artificial synapse, we need an electrical device that's got a memory effectively. That w instead of just, we pass a current through, we put a voltage across it and we pass a current through it, in a standard resistor, there's no memory of what's happened. There's no memory of that current. To really get what the brain is doing, and certainly to get learning and to get memory, we need to have a memory. We need to have the, the device, the synapse, the artificial synapse, remember what happened to it in the past. We need a component with, with a, a, a memory. That's a simple component that we can synthesize, that we can fabricate. Moreover, not just that we can fabricate, but that we can um, fabricate easily and also scale. So we can get lots and lots and lots of these on a chip. We also don't just want to mimic what's happening with CMOS. We don't have the, the same, we face the same problem again in terms of energy dissipation. So we want something that doesn't have the same level of energy dissipation and causes the same amount of heat. Because this, we can do a lot, as I said, on 20 watts, GPUs are taking hundreds of watts. And you, you know, it's an awful lot of heat energy being generated, it's an awful lot of energy being wasted. So we got to try and push that efficiency up. Back in 2008, and I've scribbled all over this, I apologize. There was this paper, which has caused a great deal of controversy. As you can see, the missing memorist are found. So I'll write a blog post on this, so to fill in the details. Some of you I know are really interested in maths. Some of you are not interested in maths. I'll write a blog post that puts the, the mathematical detail in. But basically, up until this point, the argument is we had resistor, capacitor, and inductor. We've got four key variables here, voltage, current, charge and the magnetic flux because once we've got moving charges once we've got current we've got a magnetic field this group claim as i say it's controversial claim that they found the memristor they found this component we were looking for, for for years and it turns out that that's exactly what we need for an artificial synapse and it's why all those papers have neuromorphic computing with memristors because the memristor is a really simple way and it's a really simple to fabricate device that allows us to make an artificial synapse. 12 years of research since that paper though. I mean, surely somebody's come up with something better or something that people well, isn't, well, controversy you said, right? Yeah, it's controversial in terms of what, is that really a fundamental component? But what absolutely isn't controversial, and even those who will argue against the fact that it is a fundamental component or not, will say this in terms of neuromorphic computing, in terms of mimicking here, it is a massive step forward. How does a memory work. I would say an extreme example of a memristor is a fuse. You pass a current through it and it blows. It's got a pretty extreme memory of the last state before it blew. That's not particularly useful because it's dead obviously, but you can have a much less extreme version of that whereby you do something to the material as you pass a current through it. So when you stop, you know, you don't apply the voltage anymore and the current isn't flowing, you halt it at that particular point, so it's got a memory. And what do you do in terms of controlling that resistance? You do, in many ways, exactly what the brain does, or what the neurons and the, 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 the biological architecture of the brain does, is you control ion flow. And so in that particular Hewlett-Packard paper, they had titanium dioxide, which is a, an insulator usually, so very well used material, and particularly when it comes to solar cell technology, it's very important. And they had regions of that um, sample which were doped, which means they had impurities which changed the conductivity, and regions which were undoped. And the important thing is what happens is when they put the voltage on, they cause those impurities to diffuse, all right? And so that means they change the conductivity. Those impurities move, move under the influence of the electric field. So we've got a voltage across this sample, and that creates an electric field. So is this a tiny variable resistor? 
That's exactly it. That is a very good way of thinking about it, Sean. Wonderful. It's a tiny variable resistor. Potentiometer like that. Obviously, if we have a volume, you know, you just turn it to a certain volume and that's, it's there. That's what we're doing in, in essence. We're changing, but we're doing it at the level of changing the material properties. This is a really simple, very unsophisticated d demo, but what we have is that the box represents our sample and these yellow balls represent the impurity atoms in that sample. What happens in the real sample is you have a voltage and that generates an electric field across the device and that causes these impurities to move. We're not going to put an electrostatic potential on this, we're going to put a gravitational potential on this, but it's the same general idea. You have a gradient in the field and that causes the particles to move. And by causing the particles to move, you change the resistance of the device. So with a normal resistor, we're just going to do Ohm's law. We're just going to do V is equal to IR. You'll allow me just one equation, Sean. Linear. So we've got current versus voltage. And you do that. Current depends linearly on voltage. But more importantly, you increase the voltage, you decrease the voltage. You increase the voltage, you decrease the voltage. You follow this line back and forth. So that's for a traditional resistor. Normal component bog standard resistor that we find in practically every circuit. For a mem resistor, the most important difference is that instead of it being exactly the same curve every time, because you are changing the device when you apply a voltage to it, when you change those impurities and move them around, it means you have hysteresis. It means you have a memory. So the current voltage curve you get on the way up is not the same as the current voltage curve you get on the way down. And we have what's called a hysteresis loop, and that gives us memory. And it's really, really elegant because it's controlling, it's exactly analogous in many ways to the biological system because the reason we're getting this hysteresis, the reason we're getting this memory is because we're controlling ion flow. But not in a liquid. You can do it in a liquid, and there are examples of neuromorphic computing in a liquid. But with a laptop, you know, you don't have a lot of li liquid in a laptop. It's a solid state device. And what we're doing is we're translating that biological computing to a solid state platform. And we've got memory. From a practical point of view, how would that hysteresis be used? Just like neuron spike. So neurons spike, they send a potential spike. Um, and that controls the, that's how you learn. You have what's called short-term plasticity and long-term potentiation. So what will happen is you will have um, connections that last a short amount of time. With this, what you do is you spike, you create a snapshot of where the ion concentration is, and you remember that. And then if you keep going, what you can even do is to mimic long-term learning in the brain, is what will happen is that those ions will connect, and you'll have a connection um, throughout the device, which forms a long-term connection, just like you form neural pathways. You form pathways which are due to those atoms interacting and actually bonding all the way across the, across the gap. It's like what I find amazing is when you're learning to drum, even simple things like just putting those bon John Bonham style triplets where you put one drum after the other, da 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 you start off with that and you do it at 80 beats a minute, you do it at a particular slow rate and then you build it up gradually up until the point where I could never have done that two weeks ago. And that's because you're burning those pathways into your brain. You're setting those, you're solidifying those neural pathways. That's what's happening. You can also do that in these artificial synapses, which is amazing an IP and then I can actually communicate with that server to do whatever it was I wanted to do. So just to clarify, if I put in computerfile.website or something yeah. like that, something somewhere needs to know where to yeah. find that. There will be usually one or two. I will move 25 and 35 and then I get 7 and so on. So we repeat this.